Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening uh, to all of you who are joining us from all around the world. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, to you all uh, and uh, invite you to join uh, the second asynchronous workshop that we are organizing as a part of the NSF PREPARE project. PREPARE, that stands for Pandemic Research for Preparedness and Resilience, is an NSF-funded project that began uh, in October 2021, uh, 2020, 2020, I guess, um, after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic had taken a brief uh, break, I would say, in the world here. The goal of PREPARE uh, project is fourfold. Uh, identify and foster new research efforts resulting from cross-fertilization of ideas, create a research roadmap that proposes research directions uh, for the NSF, facilitate the collection of comprehensive data and tool sets, and collect educational information that can be used by generation of scientists. The PREPARE uh, project has so far uh, been very successful. Uh, we've created a website, prepare-po.org. I encourage all of you to take a look at it. it has as a part of the website, events that are being organized, meetings that are being organized, data sets that we have collected, uh, software systems that we are collecting and such. We had our first kickoff workshop in uh, late October, early November. And uh, this was followed by a first of the three asynchronous workshops in uh, May of this year. Um, and I'm, I think the organizers will say a little bit about that as we go along. We have also started a couple of new interesting uh, ideas as a part of this. One is a podcast titled The Science Before the Storm. And then Raymond and Srini Venkatraman are co-hosting that podcast and it already has a few very nice segments. I encourage you all to take a look at the podcast. Today's workshop is the second uh, uh, in the line of three workshops that we are organizing in the first year. The focus of the SBEG workshop is on understanding the new issues in social, behavioral, economic, and governance aspects that have uh, really uh, arisen uh, during the course of this particular pandemic. We've planned a number of different sessions I'm going to let Anil and his co-organizers talk a bit more about the workshop. But once again, uh, welcome everyone. And I hope you have an enjoyable time during the uh, meeting. Uh, this is really supposed to be a lively and interactive meeting. Beyond the talks, uh, we encourage folks to participate in the discussions that will go on asynchronously. With that, Anil, uh, I'll pass on the baton to you. Thanks, Madhav. Uh... So uh, yeah, Mother was already uh, introduced to, to the uh, themes of the topic. And so we have four sessions uh, which uh, uh, go over uh, the different uh, issues in, uh, as part of SBEG. So uh, first I'd like to uh, thank uh, our uh, uh, program committee. So Maya Majumdar, Mark Orr, Pete Piroli, and Vivek Singh, and all of the prepared uh, team members. So Erin Raymond, uh, Golda Barrow, Mother and uh, Simon, uh, with, without their help, uh, we would not have been able to do this. And I'd like to thank all the speakers who have been able to uh, participate uh, in the middle of uh, travel and uh, all of the other commitments. So um, uh, this is uh, asynchronous. So we'll have uh, uh, the live uh, uh, stream uh, on this. Uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, you can uh, tweet your questions uh, there or post your questions in that uh, <clears throat> live chat. Uh, Mother already mentioned the uh, podcast and the uh, the website, uh, uh, and you can sign up there uh, and and uh, get uh, uh, be part of the community. Um, so uh, next, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Gurdeep Singh, uh, CNS uh, Division Director. So uh, give a few remarks. Thank you, Anil. Um, <coughs> good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
Uh, it's uh, on behalf of NSF, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to, to this uh, workshop. Um, so I'm Gurdeep Singh, I'm the Division Director for the Computer and Network Systems Division. Uh, so this is the division which um, uh, at least we initially started, we funded the Prepare uh, uh, Virtual Organization, Prepare Project out of this. Um, um, so as, as Anil and Madhav mentioned, uh, this is the second workshop uh, in the series of um, uh, the three workshops uh, that, that have been planned. And uh, this workshop is focusing on uh, topics of misinformation, equity and health disparities, governance and economic impact and behavioral modeling. Okay. So these are all, you know, very, very timely topic. Uh, the, uh, ongoing pandemic has really brought uh, many of the challenges regarding these to the forefront. Uh, you know, for instance, um, uh, misinformation research, uh, you know, a lot of our data now is, you know, a lot of data and we consume everything online. So, so more and more of our lives sort of depend upon the data that we consume and, uh, and, and, it's, and the misinformation that may be there due to various reasons. Uh, well, you know, has, has, has a tremendous impact on that, uh, on this. Similarly, you know, equity and health disparities, they have also become a lot more apparent now uh, because with the ongoing uh, pandemic, you know, we, we actually see a very immediate impact of these on our daily lives. So, you know, whether it is with respect to uh, the healthcare that we uh, are able to afford due to economic disparities, whether it's the economic impact in terms of uh, job availabilities and all. So we, we are seeing the impact of these happening uh, uh, in very, very immediately in our daily lives. So it has become, these issues have risen up to the top. So, so in that sense, you know, what we want to do is, you know, collectively think about, you know, what are the challenges um, and how do we uh, address them? So, so as I said, this makes it a very timely topic. It's, at, you know, pillars of our uh, current uh, uh, administration in terms of their priorities. So it's an uh, important time, you know, in which we can observe, collect data and, and, and become prepared and not just to address the challenges that are there right now before us, but also in some sense, uh, try to build a lot more resilient system and resilient infrastructure so that we can proactively respond to the future challenges that we have. So today, you know, there are two panels that are organized, one on governance, economic impact, the other on equality, equity and health disparities. So really want to thank uh, the moderators, uh, Mark and Maya for organizing them and also to the panelists for participating. Um, uh, finally, want to thank the workshop organizers, you know, the prepare team, uh, Madhav, Anu, um, Aaron, and also the program committee for the workshops uh, to do all of the work in terms of organizing these. And, and also specifically want to uh, thank uh, uh, James Joshi, he's our uh, NSF program director, uh, you know, who's uh, supporting these, this prepare project and the workshops for diligently working behind the scenes in, in making sure that um, uh, this uh, the project and these workshops are successful. So, so with that, you know, welcome again to these uh, to this workshop and uh, I wish you the best for the rest of the workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kurtip. And uh, thanks again to you and uh, James and uh, all the uh, NSF program managers for their constant support and encouragement. Uh, Okay. So um, now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mark Kaur, who will moderate our first session on economics and governance. Mark. Okay. Uh, thank you, Neil. So we have some changes to of our original speakers. Um, they, there was some emergency that cropped up today. So we um, will have two speakers this morning. Um, we're going to have Kimmy Dion and Brian Lewis. Brian Lewis thankfully stepped in. He's one of our colleagues um, at UVA Biocomplexity Institute. Um, so we're going to get right to it. Again, this is the governance and, and economic aspects of pandemics panel. Um, 
We're going to start with uh, Kimmy Dion. She is a professor at UC Riverside. Her research is um, uh, <coughs> on health interventions, politics, and public opinion. Um, she's in the Department of Political Science. Um, just to keep, just to remind everybody, if you have questions, use the live chat in YouTube, or you can tag at Twitter, NSF underscore prepare. Um, and with that, I think we can just hand it over to Kimmy and get started. Um, the questions I'm gonna, just so everybody knows, I'm gonna ask, if, as you ask questions, we're gonna wait till the end of both talks and then we'll go through the questions and it'll be my job to pull the questions and we'll have a nice discussion. Okay, well, with that, I think we're ready to go on to Kimmy. Kimmy, over to you. Great, thanks so much, um, Mark, for the introduction and, and thank you, Anil, for inviting me um, to share this um, this work with you all. So the title of what I'm going to present today is um, The Politics of Pandemic Othering and Trust, COVID-19 and Historical Perspective. Um, this is drawing in particular on a recent publication of mine with Philia Felicity Turkmen, um, where we examine pandemic othering in, um, in history and also in the contemporary pandemic. And so since it's, it's really focused on pandemic othering, I just want to make sure that we you know, have a have a similar sense of what what I mean by that. Um, and as social scientists define it, othering takes place when one group of people, usually a majority group or a dominant group, targets a marginalized group and treats them as if there's something wrong with them by identifying perceived flaws um, in the outgroup's appearance or their practices or their norms. Um, and so we consider pandemic othering as acts of othering that occur in the context of a pandemic, right? Um, and of course, you know, anyone who you know, has been around uh, in, um, in this current pandemic, especially here in the United States, has seen this othering happen, you know, from, you know, um, from the highest levels of government. Um, and, you know, the discrimination and violence that's happened against marginalized groups, not just here in the United States, strikes, um, strikes a chord with the history of pandemics and how, um, how this is not, even if it is um, you know, um, concerning, it's, it's not new. And so, um, oh, this is the paper that I mentioned. If, um, if anyone wanted to read it or download it, it is available. Cambridge um, University Press, which publishes international organization, has made this article and all of the articles in its special issue on coronavirus uh, available for free um, to the public. In that paper, we argue that um, in a global politics that's characterized by racialized inequality, pandemics like COVID-19 exacerbate the marginalization of already oppressed groups. So I think it's pretty obvious you know, to anyone alive in 2021 that there's significant inequality in the world and there's inequality within societies. And what we argue is that when that inequality, especially when it's racialized, um, when an epidemic or a pandemic emerges, it leads to a further marginalization or, um, or um, oppression of already marginalized or oppressed groups. And we look in, at pandemics from the past to show these patterns. Um, so we review published research on previous pandemics like um, smallpox in the late 19th century, uh, the third bubonic plague, um, the, what, people have wrongly termed the Spanish flu, what we call the 1918 to 1919 influenza pandemic, um, the ongoing HIV AIDS pandemic, SARS and Ebola. So for today's presentation, I'm just going to share uh, what we've learned from a few of the pandemics that we surveyed in our paper. Um, and compiling these reports, we document the discrimination and um, violence targeting marginalized groups as well during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, you know, I hope in hearing this presentation, you walk away with the understanding that putting COVID-19 in this historical context lays bare this, this continuation of um, othering and blame that happens during disease outbreaks. And so if we're thinking about, you know, how do we build resilience, right, for the future pandemics to come, um, you know, if history is teaching us anything, 
one really important aspect of um, pandemic response is going to involve you know, thinking about marginalized groups and, um, and what happens to them during pandemics. Um, likewise, um, going beyond othering and blame, um, earlier pandemics also offer insights into the role of trust in pandemic response. And they highlight the obstacles that are posed by racialized marginalization in generating the trust necessary to collectively combat infectious disease outbreaks. And what I would argue is that the lack of trust in marginalized populations is, is due to their marginalization. And so again, if you're thinking about building resilience, right, and, um, and preparedness for future pandemics, um, it's going to be important in divided societies to think about those groups that have um, been marginalized in the past. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit uh, in, in this talk about um, how this research from earlier pandemics shows that the role of trust matters for how ordinary people will take up the behaviors necessary to prevent the spread of infectious disease. So with that, let's go back in time. Uh, to get us started, this uh, photo is from 1897 Karachi in what is today Pakistan, uh, but at the time was part of the British Empire. Um, this photo is part of the Wellcome Trust Library. It, it's, an, it's an archive that comes um, from a series of photos actually that, that um, were taken of uh, the Plague Committee and their work and the Plague Committee com consisted mostly of volunteers who were organized into parties and were responsible for the segregation and inoculation of various districts in, um, in, the, in the British Empire in uh, South Asia. Um, and if I advance a slide, there's, there's a quote. This quote comes from um, you know, the tag in the Wellcome Trust Library about the photo, um, the plague, uh, uh, about what the Plague Committee does. Um, but if you look at this, um, the, the summaries, the captions on these photos, there's no discussion of empire. There's no discussion of repression, right? Um, it's very anodyne, right? Oh, we just segregate and inoculate, you know, um, but there's, there's um, if, if you just look at the photo, you can see, you know, who's seated, who's standing, who looks like they're in charge, who looks like they have power um, and who doesn't. Um, now, what called for this kind of quarantine? Being on the international trade route, there was immense pressure on the British imperial government to control the emergency. The bubonic plague was highly contagious and um, human transmission was an important source of spreading the disease um, as humans carried uh, the germs with them. The Plague Commission recommended you know, what they called necessary preventive measures to disinfect and evaluate infected places, to put control over mass transit, and to improve sanitary conditions. And I'm sure this sounds familiar to anyone who's living through this pandemic, right? That, that it's about isolation, about control, right? You know, who gets to fly in airplanes um, and, and who's, you know, how, how many times is someone disinfecting in between, um, you know, usage of, uh, of, of places. Um, so I wanna just quote Muhammad Mushtaq in his study of public health in British colonial India. Um, in, in his analysis, he says, there was a vigorous execution of the act. Uh, colonial power was used for forceful segregation of infected persons, disinfections, evacuation, and even demolition of infected places was carried out. Medical and administrative officials had the right to inspect any suspected person or place. They may have called for detention of any person from ships and railways. Riots were reported in some areas, but the government used the military power to ensure proper enforcement of necessary preventive measures. This vigorous execution of the act is not applied equally. During the third bubonic plague, which lasted from 1894 to 1950, societies around the world linked the pandemic with discourses on race, immigration, and class, 
and states instituted racialized plague control measures. White South Africans linked the plague to race and immigration, as did elites in Buenos Aires and Rio de Janeiro. In all of these cases, scientific authorities had also instrumentalized the disease outbreak to promote social engineering that pushed unwanted groups to the margins of urban settings, literally you know, taking over the most prime real estate in a city. In the colonial French Pacific, the outbreak brought to the surface racial and class tensions between white settlers and the majority population in, in what is New Caledonia. In the United States, Chinese and Japanese experienced discrimination, for example, while all travelers were subject to inspection upon an arrival in San Francisco's port, only Chinese and Japanese travelers were subject to detention, and they were detained sometimes for weeks. There are also reports of incidents in which Americans in China were targeted and accused of importing plague, and there was violence against foreigners during the pandemic. Um, it was sufficiently bad, actually, that the American consul in Canton um, had wired his concerns about the safety of American citizens in, in China. Um, in the still ongoing HIV AIDS pandemic, there's multiple accounts of othering and blame. In the early years of the AIDS pandemic, the actions and ideologies of dominant institutions in the United Kingdom and the United States um, constructed AIDS as a problem of marginalized groups. Some of you may be old enough to remember when AIDS first came out, it was called GRID, gay-related infectious disease, right? So um, there was targeting of, of, of white gay men Patients in North America were likewise targets of discrimination and blame early in the AIDS pandemic, not least because of speculation that the virus originated in Haiti. Blame and othering associated with AIDS is not uniquely American. Um, the work of my colleague, Adam Lieberman, who's a political scientist at MIT, has studied, uh, for example, the role of um, boundary, racial and ethnic boundary institutions in Brazil, South Africa, and India to show that those boundary institutions um, reflected uh, existing marginalization, but also then exacerbated response, poor response to, um, to AIDS in those, in, in those affected areas. In South Africa, in particular, people associated AIDS with immigrants, and blamed these outsiders for bringing HIV into the country. Uh, the government repatriated migrant workers of um, nationality groups with higher rates of HIV. For example, the country that I study, Malawi, um, 13,000 minors were sent back to Malawi between 1988 and 1992 after 200 of them tested positive for HIV. Um, of course, at the same time, um, there was unrest in among um, Black uh, Black South Africans who were looking for more opportunities for work, and Malawian miners served as a scapegoat for the South African government, right? They can say, oh, these people have lots of HIV, so we're sending them back, when in fact it was their repatriation to Malawi that allowed um, those opportunities to work in the mines to be opened to Black South Africans as they were agitating for greater, um, greater um, political and economic power in, um, in an increasingly um, free South Africa. More recently, the 2013 to 2016 Ebola pandemic centered in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone in West Africa offers multiple examples of othering and blame in the United States. People associated Ebola with Africans and immigrants more broadly after a traveler from Liberia was diagnosed with Ebola in Dallas, Texas in October 2014. Um, African immigrants in the Dallas-Fort Worth area experienced discrimination during this period, and they attributed that to their Africanness, um, their accents to being Black, and in some cases just being, you know, recognized as having roots or ties to an African country. Um, you might recall this uh, really deeply problematic news, um, Newsweek uh, magazine cover that, again, you know, kind of otherized Africans, right, thinking of them as people who eat bush meat and are going to be, be the back door for how Ebola you know, um, crystallizes as an epidemic in, in the United States. Um, but the US is not alone, right? Um, in Italy during, um, during the pandemic, um, a study found that prejudice towards African immigrants was positively related to risk perception of Ebola and negatively related to levels of knowledge about Ebola. So that means it wasn't just that people had prejudiced uh, opinions about Africans in Italy, but that those prejudices that they held actually affected 
how, how Italians themselves navigated the Ebola pandemic. Even in Africa, in Senegal, um, there were patterns of uh, Ebola era xenophobic outbursts by Senegalese against migrant pool populations, people who um, had migrated from Guinea. Um, and that highlighted uh, the extent to which, you know, um, there were these micro dynamics of outbreaks of xenophobia uh, during a public health crisis, you know, even in a place where in the kind of global imagination Ebola was, um, was central. Now, just to talk a bit about trust during previous pandemics, and I really want to emphasize here. So if all of the stuff on racism bored you, like this is the part that you have to pay attention to. Trust is really a serious predictor of whether or not people are going to take up protective behaviors during, during a pandemic. I think we've, we've thought this for a while, but it is only in the more recent pandemics that I feel like we've had um, some, some rigorous evaluation of how trust operates. Um, and in particular, I wanna cite the study by Rob Blair and colleagues that examined um, trust during the Ebola outbreak um, in West Africa. In particular, they looked um, at, uh, they collected survey data in Liberia. They found that respondents who expressed low trust in government were much less likely to take precautions against Ebola in their homes, much less likely to abide by government mandated social distancing mechanisms, that were designed to contain the spread of the virus, and they were also much less likely to support potentially contentious control policies like the safe burial of um, Ebola-infected um, people who had died, uh, as well as, of course, quarantines. Um, following on that study, um, Patrick Vink and colleagues did a did a similar study in Eastern Congo during the subsequent Ebola outbreak in, um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. They found that low institutional trust and belief in misinformation were associated with a decreased likelihood of adopting preventive behaviors, right? So for the folks who are going to be part of the panel on misinformation, I think that this study is really important for understanding, um, you know, whether people will uptake preventive behaviors like you know, accepting, you know, in this case, it was Ebola vaccines, but we can, we can generalize to, um, to the current pandemic as well, I think, and, and future pandemics, as well as seeking formal health care. So it's not just protective behaviors that are, um, that are affected, but it's actually care seeking behaviors, which then matter for the potential spread of a pandemic. Finally, um, the paper, which I'm most excited about, um, very recent publication by Leo Ariola and Alison Manius Grossman that kind of takes both topics that I've, that I've been talking about today and brings them together. Um, so what they find in their study is that members of a politically marginalized ethnic group, the poll in Guinea, which again, I had mentioned when we were talking about Senegal earlier, they were significantly less likely to comply with a public health advisory from the national government representative, the president, when compared to either local or religious leaders in this survey experiment that Ariel and Grossman had done. And what they show is that the perceived ethnic discrimination conditions whether these, you know, poll, um, poll people in Guinea um, trusted and complied with different authority types. So trust is important. And what Ariola and Grossman are, are finding and showing us is that trust is rooted in an experience of marginalization. And you know, to bring it back to the contemporary pandemic and to think about what this means for pandemic othering, when you engage in othering during a pandemic and further marginalize an already marginalized group, you're actually making it harder for, um, for any successful pandemic response. Um, I'm sure as many of you who live in the United States that are tuned in today, you're, you're aware of the pandemic othering that occurred during um, this current pandemic. Um, because US President Donald Trump and his administration regularly engaged in rhetoric placing blame on China, much of the attention has been on anti-Chinese and anti-Asian rhetoric, discrimination, and violence in the United States. 
early in the pandemic, Asian Americans were refused services, were even targets of racist violence. Um, as you may know, organizations that have been tracking uh, these uh, acts of discrimination and violence, including Stop AAPI Hate and AAPI Data, have shown a significant surge in these incidents and, and have documented a range of the types of incidents that, that people have experienced. Likewise, in France, Asians have been the targets of racist incidents on public transport, in shops, at school, even just walking down the street. Um, a, a trend on Twitter was Je ne suis pas un virou, right? This, this, I, this um, kind of collective reimagining of, of what it means to have an Asian identity in France. Um, in the United Kingdom, a Singaporean exchange student was badly beaten by assailants invoking the COVID-19 outbreak. This again happened very early in the emergence of the pandemic. Um, Chinese also faced discrimination in other parts of Asia. So it wasn't just you know, in, 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 in um, predominantly white countries um, that Chinese faced discrimination. But even in China, uh, where the first COVID-19 cases emerged, there were multiple incidents of increased discrimination of Africans after the media reported that five Nigerians had tested positive for COVID-19 in Guangzhou, a city in Southern China with a very significant um, African immigrant population. There were hateful online messages and multiple violent attacks of Muslims across India after government officials blamed um, an Islamic seminary for spreading COVID-19. During the state imposed um, coronavirus lockdown uh, last year in May, uh, Hindu attackers burned Muslim homes and shops and vandalized a mosque and a Muslim shrine um, over three days of violence and terror in West Bengal. Um, there are also, uh, the, the Mixed Migration Center has uh, excellent reports on documenting all of, um, well, not all of, I should say, a, a representative sample of some of the experiences that, that um, migrants worldwide have faced uh, from Tunisia to Peru, um, you know, just in, in, in being a migrant during COVID-19. Um, now, I wanna talk about what we know about COVID-19 and trust. And this is from colleagues at the Vidze Bay in, in Berlin. Um, I'm sure you cannot see this graph that, that, um, that I have up here, but this is a really exciting paper about um, all of the potential things that affect COVID-19 mortality. A lot of people have talked about populist leaders, about women leaders. Um, and so this really neat paper takes all available data to study some of these things that, that the political science research has said should matter for crises like pandemics, but also what the media has reported as, as, um, as potentially important and put together a lasso model to see, you know, um, which of these seems to have um, most impact or, you know, most likely, most correlated, I should say, with COVID-19 mortality. And, um, and there's a range, there's a range of um, variables included, but I want to just zero in um, on, um, you know, what, uh, what the authors refer to as state capacity and point your attention to the bottom line, it's trust. So um, looking at three different points in time, right? March 30th, 2020, June 1st, 2020, and then um, most recently, April 26th, 2021. And you can see, you know, some things, you know, um, are, are not really statistically significant, whether you include by, you know, just do a bivariate analysis or include controls. Um, but one thing is consistently, consistently good at, you know, cor consistently correlated with less COVID death and that's institutional trust. The more trust a population has in its government, the fewer deaths that country will um, experience from COVID-19. Um, you can find out more about this really neat project and even download the data that the authors have um, from, from the website listed here. Now, I just, I think I'm going a bit over, so I'm gonna just breeze through what um, some of the consequences are of the pandemic othering that we've seen um, in, these, um, in these various outbreaks, um, why they matter, um, why they matter for um, not, just, um, not just this current pandemic, but, but um, 
why they might matter, why they might leave a lasting legacy beyond um, beyond this pandemic. Now, um, you know, just there's the normative concerns of othering during pandemics, which on their own are sufficient for rejecting the practice, right? Othering also has these important consequences for politics, policy, and most importantly, public health. Um, so um, the primary socio-political consequence of pandemic othering is the exacerbation of existing tensions and inequalities between and within groups. Um, migrants and people from marginalized groups report experiences of discrimination across the pandemics that we examined. And um, there is work in particular, um, you know, here in the United States, um, but also in Australia that shows um, that the COVID-19 crisis, um, people associate it with a group, um, and in particular Asians, um, people, and people of Asian descent, and that activates already existing xenophobic attitudes toward that group. Um, now there are some policy consequences of pandemic othering and that includes both policy action and policy inaction. Um, policies on border restrictions are probably the most prominent. We can all think of, you know, when things happen, you know, the immediate shutdown of borders and, and, and inopportunity to travel. Um, pandemic othering shapes those policies, however, you know, who was allowed to still fly in to, to countries that had supposedly closed their borders, right? Um, in the United States, for example, there was a study that did um, that looked at the past two centuries and found evidence of a quarantine logic used as a medical rationale um, to isolate and stigmatize social groups that were already reviled for other reasons. So, um, you know, there was a typhus outbreak in Mexico in um, the early 1900s. And that led to a full-scale quarantine in El Paso, Texas in 1917. And even though that typhus epidemic ended a few months later, medical inspections targeting Mexicans, Mexican entrance into the United States continued until the 1930s. So an epidemic that lasted for a few months in 1917 had impact on who was allowed and who was inspected upon entry um, for more than a decade later. Pandemic othering and blame can also have consequences for policy beyond the public health domain, especially when politicians politicize pandemics um, to further goals in other policy realms. So for example, I had a study um, with Clara Dita and Melina Platas where we show that the 2013 to 2016 Ebola outbreak um, exemplified how political elites, in that case, uh, Republican politicians in the United States can use the threat of infectious disease to shift citizens' attitudes to be more exclusionary, to be more negative toward immigration more broadly, even when it's not tied um, to the, no longer tied to the pandemic. Um, pandemic othering can also have um, consequences for policy inaction. I mentioned the, the work of Evan Lieberman earlier, and he shows, for example, um, a lack of policy response in South Africa because of this belief that, you know, it's those other people who are getting sick, so we don't actually um, need to have a coordinated policy action. Um, finally, as you'll see on the slide here, um, and what I think is perhaps the most important consequence of pandemic othering, it's the implications for public health. When people associate a disease with a marginalized group and, and that group or, or that disease is stigmatized, They'll avoid being marginalized um, by, um, by disassociating with that group. Um, they'll potentially deny early symptoms, uh, delay seeking care. Um, early in the COVID-19 pandemic, Asian Americans debated whether to wear masks because doing so could draw unwanted attention and, um, and potentially provoke physical attacks. Researchers found the attribution of AIDS to foreigners and to complacency and denial um, I'm sorry, led to complacency and denial, and, and they worried that such denial could further a silent spread of, of disease. Um, let me just say in conclusion, um, I think one of the most important things in pandemic response is whether, um, whether people in a country believe the government. And their likelihood is, as, as we know from you know, many scholars, including you know, Kathy Cohen and her work, Boundaries of Blackness and studying the AIDS pandemic in the United States and how it affected black populations um, here in America, you know, there is a long history 
of marginalization and there's a long history of medical marginalization and that shapes whether people believe and trust their governments. And that trust affects whether people adopt protective preventive behavior, behaviors. And if we want to be resilient during this pandemic and in preparation for future pandemics, there is a really long, hard task that's needed to, um, to build that trust. And that is going to be really hard to overcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kimmy. Okay, we're going to, uh, let me introduce the next speaker, um, Brian Lewis, and please put your questions in the chat or on Twitter at NSF underscore prepare. Um, we're gonna review questions for both talks at the end of the next speaker. Uh, so let me introduce Brian Lewis. He's, he's our next speaker. He's a research associate professor um, in the Network Sciences, uh, System Sciences and Advanced Computing Division at the Biocomplexity Institute at University of Virginia. Um, his research is focused on understanding tra transmission of dynamics of infectious disease. He's a computational epidemiologist, uh, excuse me, computational epidemiologist um, and uses simulation and analysis for his work. Um, and has worked with government and industry and all kinds of things. So um, I think with that, um, let's just hand it over to Brian, see what he has to say, and then we'll get to the questions after that. So Brian, it, you are up. Thanks, Mark. Um, let me get this window shared. All right, hoping that you can see this just fine. Yeah. And yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, it, my role in here, I'm gonna try and provide an overview and some of it's by example of uh, the support we've given to the government response during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've worked with uh, a variety of different agencies over the years doing simulations for infectious diseases of uh, various types. And uh, one of the main roles I've uh, taken on in this group is we have a lot of really cool simulations and analyses and uh, technical capabilities, but the translation into action on the government side um, needs a little bit of a messenger. And I, I worked early part of my career in a public health agency out in the California Department of Health as a, the TB control office there. Um, and with that experience and uh, that my public health training, um, I've been able to sort of help translate some of these um, more sophisticated analyses that we've undertaken uh, to, and put it in sort of the terms of the decisions that many of the governments are trying to make. And so I'll uh, give an overview of the government partners we've worked with and the kinds of decisions. And so main two partners have been the Department of Defense, uh, as well as the Virginia Department of Health and the Department of Emergency Management here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And with the DOD, uh, Department of Defense, we've mainly been working with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, this is often referred to as DITRA. Uh, and they mainly are involved, we've worked with these folks for uh, quite a while, over, uh, over a decade, and their sort of mission is to sort of deal with weapons of mass destruction and um, other kinds of sort of catastrophic kinds of issues that might face the world in the U.S. and help maintain the, the Department of Defense's ability to respond to those. And, did, and the subgroup in there themselves is reach back and they sort of serve as a clearinghouse for all sorts of different requests and we've mainly handled a lot of their uh, pandemic response kind of requests so we, we were quite involved in um, the federal level uh, with the Ebola uh, pandemic support uh, during the West African outbreak in 14-15 and then uh, also just ad hoc bioterror tabletops and these kinds of course of action and sort of just training for these sort of emergency kinds of um, conditions. And then other outbreaks of infectious diseases as they come up with like, for instance, Zika, cholera, uh, measles in Europe, uh, other, other kinds of uh, pandemic influenza multiple times, um, those kinds of things. And so with that history, we're sort of a little bit prepared and had already sort of done these kinds of support roles in the past. So when COVID-19 hit, uh, we were supporting you know, sort of the all agency response at the federal government, the Department of Defense always has a seat at those tables along with the CDC, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so, but we're also giving support for DOD to just guide their personnel and uh, their operations. So they were really concerned about 
what things might look like in New Jersey because they have army bases in New Jersey and they need to be able to give guidance to the people who run those. And so that was sort of our role on, on the federal level um, that the state level uh, for the Commonwealth of Virginia um, involved with a lot of different teams within the Department of Health and the Department of Emergency Management. Uh, there is also an interesting thing that Virginia has. They have this, they call it VEST, and it's a multi-agency, you know, Virginia emergency support team. And so all the various different point people from different agencies that are involved, and this got activated, and it's like a legal framework that allows sort of people to be activated, funded, and devote their resources to it. They have these regular standing action, command and control kind of operations set up. Um, people take on tasks, report back, et cetera. And so we've been helping out um, through that sort of support team as well. And the history with them is not quite as deep. We've worked and collaborated with the Department of Health with uh, influenza forecasting in the past. So we sort of knew a few folks there, but we weren't quite as deeply ingrained. And then for the COVID-19 support, like we're really sort of looking at different government decisions and trying to lend quantitative scientific proof that some of the decisions they were making um, were legitimate and well supported by the science. And then there's just operational decisions about how they optimize their contact tracing operations. Uh, there's decisions about whether they should start building some of these mobile hospital units that we saw some states do, some countries have to do to support uh, healthcare systems being overwhelmed. And so we were trying to project into the future and say whether or not it looked like they were going to have so many hospitalizations that they would need to start contracting to build out these facilities. And they were able to hold off on that for a couple of weeks and then uh, things slowed down enough that they realized that they didn't indeed need them. And so we were glad we were able to sort of advise in that capacity and sort of save millions of dollars and effort, et cetera. And so this is the sort of the feel for the kind of support we've given to the government partners and uh, the kinds of decisions that they got into, um, uh, I can cover a little bit later. Uh, the key part that we've, the key way we've do, been doing this is through um, basically weekly briefings and um, data products that we've delivered. Uh, and then also it's just the engagement within the um, smaller teams throughout the um, throughout the government. And so you may have someone who is running one of these army bases um, in New Jersey that is really curious about when will this outbreak, this current surge we're experiencing in the southern part of New Jersey, for instance, uh, when will that ameliorate? Uh, when will they be able to reopen the base to normal operations or uh, stop having restrictions at the gates uh, at a certain level? And so that kind of granularity is requested as well as sort of a higher level um, where we are kind of trying to decide, you know, should Virginia institute a mask mandate? Um, Virginia, you know, shut down um, a lot of different businesses, basically saying indoor dining is not allowed. And uh, they wanted to know how much they might be able, like what reduction in the cases they might be able to expect from that. And so with these weekly briefings, we're doing some data analysis some situational awareness. We're also providing an analysis of model projections. So the models get updated every week. Uh, we're doing a bunch of what if scenarios into the future uh, to play out some of these policy choices that they might be considering and sort of analyzing those results. Uh, and then we're also doing some ad hoc simulation studies that weren't quite on a regular basis, but maybe looked at the reopening of schools, for instance, uh, and what different levels of mitigation uh, effects might have that so they could guide uh, how they were going to uh, advise uh, the public school system here in the, in the state. In addition to that, we were providing data products. And so this is an interesting sort of difference um, and an interesting sort of sign that the government is getting to a, a sort of a more sophisticated uh, level with the way that they interact um, with these decision support tools. So we were creating these large data sets that were basically a summary of uh, the projections, as well as some analytic products as well. And they were being made widely available and different people throughout the Commonwealth and in the uh, DOD side would like download these CSVs and maybe look very specifically in their particular county or their general area, or maybe at the FEMA regional level. Uh, and they were able to sort of see, these are the projected number of cases, hospitalizations, um, mortality, different uh, projections on uh, the number of deaths to anticipate. And they were using these often to 
make decisions about how many test kits they should buy. And so there's a lot of these just sort of operational planning situations that uh, the different people at different tiers in government need to sort of pay attention to. And by providing the sort of detailed data structure with the supporting uh, slides that sort of explained what that data really meant and what the assumptions going into them were, uh, people were using these uh, data products to sort of make those kinds of decisions. And then the key part here again is with this in, in continued engagement. So part of the, beyond just giving a briefing and some data products, like we're spending hours and hours in different meetings, hearing the different concerns, questions, problems uh, that were arising in these different corners of government uh, to try and then direct future analyses or different analytic products or whatever we could use our existing tools with and try and guide them to how they could uh, use it to help answer those questions. Um, and those questions, you know, they evolve over um, the pandemic. And so in the early stages, there's a lot of just like, is it going to come to the US? How bad will it get? Are you serious? You really think it could be that bad? There's a lot of sort of skepticism early on about whether this really was going to be sort of the um, Hurricane Sandy was sort of the way I put it. Unfortunately, it really did seem like this was going to be the perfect storm. It had high transmissibility and high severity. Um, and so it was hard to get people to sort of adjust their thinking that this wasn't just going to be kind of a bad flu season, it would be over. Um, and then what can we do to stop it, you know, in the early stages? Uh, in the mid, early mid stages, um, sort of the summer and fall type time period is like, when can we lift these controls? How bad will it get if we do them? Um, how can we measure the effectiveness, effectiveness of these um, control measures to further justify um, keeping the, the restaurants closed during like the summer months when they make a lot of money? Um, should we open the schools in the fall? Can the universities be in person? Those kinds of questions were coming up. Um, and so we were trying to direct our analyses and uh, model results to sort of help guide those. In the late mid stage, sort of the winter, of 2020 is when things really got uh, pretty pretty grim and most states in the United States had very high uh, case rates, uh, including Virginia. Virginia is always a little lagging. So we were more in January. A lot of other states are sort of November, December and into January. Uh, there's questions about, seems like the healthcare infrastructure is starting to get overwhelmed. How long is this going to last? How much more overwhelmed is it going to be? Um, when will the vaccine, since the vaccine finally had come out, when will the vaccine start to have an effect? Uh, and so we're directing our simulation results a little bit more in that manner. And then here in the later stages, uh, novel variants are coming up a whole lot. When can we go back to normal? Um, what about waning immunity? Uh, we'd sort of been talking about that, but now that we have a year uh, under our belt and then some, uh, like we should start seeing those effects and how strong are those effects going to be? Um, then vaccine acceptance is really the sort of really big question. Like how do we get um, more vaccine in people's arms? How many people are actually going to get vaccinated um, so that we can then look further down the road? Are we going to achieve sort of this herd immunity idea? Or are we going to have population immunity sufficient that we aren't going to be as concerned and overwhelmed with this pandemic? So to give a feel for this, um, I'm going to fall back into the weekly briefing I give. There's a lot of images in here. I didn't quite have enough time to prune all of these out. So uh, I'm glad to go back to any if anyone has any questions, but I will sort of skip through them all. And one of the key things I think to mention at the top too is like this has involved a large number of people throughout our, um, our uh, institute. Uh, a lot of people contributed from various different divisions. Uh, some people have been spending more like 24 seven on it, others have sort of weighed in with a, a day of work uh, kind of thing. Uh, and so it's been a long list of folks that have helped uh, do all of this. And I'm just sort of being the spokesperson for a lot of these works. So in these weekly um, pr presentations, I normally try and start with a, a key takeaway. And this normally is sort of timely, uh, but somewhat static, just like, where are we? What's going on? What do these projections roughly show? And then what are the new things that we've, um, we've done? Uh, and that sort of helps, you know, level set the person there. There's a lot of plots here that just sort of show the epi curves, what the test positivity is. Uh, we do this extra analysis on these epi curves to sort of show the trajectories across the Commonwealth, broken into these individual health districts, which in the Commonwealth of Virginia is where the sort of health administration um, sort of jurisdiction boundaries are. Uh, and so we do a nice little color coding here. 
back in January, this whole map was red um, with most, most places being in surge. Uh, luckily now we're in a point where most places are in decline or have plateaued because they've gotten to such uh, low levels overall. We always provide this reproductive number estimate. This was early on, the Department of Health didn't want, wasn't actually making this calculation themselves. Uh, and we were given high resolution data so that we could actually do it at a district or regional or even county level if we so chose. Uh, luckily, these numbers are all uh, pretty low. There's some of these case detection additional analyses. And then again, we get to this key question about vaccine administration. We've seen this slow down drastically. Right now, we saw a little bit of an uptick in a couple of weeks ago when we had the, um, the adolescents, the 12 to 16 year olds got cleared. And so big spike in the various different regions for that. And then here in the last week, you've heard a little bit of an echo of that as a lot of them got their second doses. Um, but now we really are getting into low levels of vaccine administration. And so the question is, where can we put those? And so we've got some analyses here that show the age breakdowns, uh, the regional breakdowns. And then the key question is how much more vaccine is there uh, available? And so we've been looking at a, a variety of surveys uh, that can measure vaccine acceptance. And we sort of break that down region by region. And so over here in the top right, basically the gray bar is sort of the expected max. That's the acceptance that at least these surveys measure. And we're correcting these for some of the biases that are in these surveys that we can see basically on how many people report having taken the vaccine versus how many people we know took the vaccine already. Uh, and so you can see this distance in these between the green bar and the gray bar, which is green is where we're currently at in terms of administrations and gray is um, where this measured acceptance level is. We're getting close to that and we are seeing these sort of rates of administration plateau out. So we're asymptoting to these sort of upper bounds. And so we break these down by region and this sort of helps health directors there know like they're getting closer and closer to like sort of the theoretical max that they might be able to achieve. I think um, previous speaker's comment about trust, I think bears through on this acceptance uh, this acceptance question, who takes the vaccine? One of the main reasons for the hesitancy uh, that gets cited is distrust in government or distrust in the vaccine itself. So this light blue line here and this darker blue line over here, some of the higher levels. One well, of the other big trends we've been seeing is that this isn't necessary. So this is the constant problem in public health. If you do a good job, and reducing health problems, then nobody is as concerned about the health problems and think that the problem is solved. We don't need to pay attention to it. And so as we get lower and lower case rates, the urgency people feel for getting vaccinated and the necessity of it is declining. And you can see that being reflected in some of these survey results. Um, and so next question that comes up is these variants of concern. And I think this has sort of led us to uh, provide the sort of update on this. And I think this is something that's like kind of confusing for a lot of people because there's all these different types and they keep giving them different names and they have numbers or they're now being called Greek letters, et cetera. And so we do try and spend some time on trying to judge this. And with the B117 or the alpha variant, we're able to see it rise up and follow a trajectory that was reasonably predictable for quite some time here. That's what this blue line is here in the US and in Virginia. Uh, but it never really fully saturated. There's enough other infectious um, uh, variants circulating that sort of outcompeted it and sort of stalled its progress out and it sort of held steady there. And so we were able to sort of provide this and say, hey, we really think alpha is gonna be a big thing and it's gonna increase the number of hospitalizations most likely uh, per case, et cetera. And so that kind of guidance I think was uh, quite useful. We also try and give little nuggets of the latest literature on each one of these. And the currently the question of course is with the Delta variant. Um, and it does seem like it's following a path like Alpha did before it, where its growth is becoming a little bit more predictable. There are many states in the US that are already at about 50%. Here in Virginia, it looks like we're a couple of weeks away uh, from getting about 50% of the um, circulating virus being, being Delta. Um, and so we, provide that kind of guidance. And this has sort of been, oops, sorry, uh, an engagement with some of the um, Virginia Department of Health folks who actually do the sequencing uh, to sort of get a read on the data that we're able to process from public sources and what they're currently seeing coming into the sequencing uh, lab, et cetera. And there's always this interesting engagement in terms of what they sort of are seeing in terms of outbreaks of the 
uh, of the variance and where those are. Uh, and that's um, a useful point here because uh, our models are necessarily a little bit coarser than uh, the fine grained uh, public health data that's available. Try and provide an overview of the, of the nation. Uh, we look at different um, racial and ethnic populations, the disproportionate burden of uh, disease with this outbreak, as we all know, has been borne by um, uh, Black uh, Americans as well as the Latinx population. Um, and so we try and keep an eye on that. As case rates have really sort of come down, uh, it's a little bit more sporadic and it seems more of the um, racial and ethnic groups sort of widespread uh, have become a little bit more affected. Uh, but we have in this plot here, basically we're showing um, the case rate versus the hospitalization rate. And these green dots are all the Latinx, different health districts in the Latinx population. And then you can see the black population here in red, uh, sort of having the highest case rates and the highest hospitalization rates adjusted for their population size. Try and level set this compared to where we were in the summer of 2020. As we get a little further, we want to normalize that zero cases is the expectation. So being better than where we were previously in the pandemic, we want to be sort of like, where we are with relation to being out of the pandemic. And so we're gonna start adjusting to that. We also try and give these nice maps that sort of concentrate where current hotspots are, um, look at healthcare workers, measure this on against the model and see that the model's tracking reasonably well, try and give areas where there really are spatial or temporal uh, hotspots. I think the vulnerability issue is a huge uh, question and certainly has been very present here in Virginia. And so if we look at measures of social vulnerability, you can see that there are quite a few counties here in purple, which have the highest level of social vulnerability, uh, but the lowest level of vaccination to date. And so we're just sort of looking at how that correlates vaccination levels versus these measures of social vulnerability. And they correlate reasonably well, um, which is to be expected, but also sort of highlights again, where these sort of areas that have low vaccination are, and they might be harder to get at so that they can sort of direct uh, resources in those directions. And then a very similar map, but we look at sort of cases that have been experienced in the last month versus the achieved uh, vaccination level. And so then we get into the model projections. And the, so I don't wanna go into the technical details of how the model works. It's basically a meta population model that we do uh, fitting. So we get the entire history um, of the epidemic um, mapped out so that the population has sort of got the population immunity. And this is at a county by county level uh, for the US as well as uh, Virginia as well. Um, we scaffold this on top of some machine learning based and statistical model based forecasts that are just pretty much purely time series forecasts. It's very hard to beat some of these auto regressive models with more complicated models. So we just use those simple models and then we fit our mechanistic model to it. Uh, and then from doing that, uh, we're able to then project into the future under different uh, conditions. And so we spell out what these conditions are. In general, it's about things staying the same as they are versus uh, things fatiguing and getting worse. Um, we also play out a couple scenarios with vaccinations where vaccination rates sort of follow along the path and reach this acceptance level that we measured in the surveys to a certain level, or um, maybe we can expand that coverage and get to some optimistically uh, higher levels. And then we also have a variant condition. And again, this is with the Delta variant, and this is a new addition, where basically we are starting to predict the course of the Delta variant here in blue, it does seem to be following this 60% more transmissible trend line. And so we are sort of forecasting it becoming increasingly dominant, increasingly transmissible, uh, and sort of bake that into the model that in a couple of weeks, the virus that's available will be more transmissible and more severe and cause more hospitalizations and deaths as well. And so that sort of gets put into these projections. So we'll go over the scenarios, et cetera. We normally present the model results. Uh, one of the key things we've been trying to do to help support government uh, and also just the local health uh, things is try and give an estimate on the hospital occupancy. And so we look at the number of beds they have available. We estimate how many might be able to be covered by COVID-19 patients, and then we project our hospitalizations into the future, um, um, which you can see sort of in aggregate for Virginia, and then sort of a regional breakdown, uh, and take into account the fact that not all hospitalizations are for one day, they last for a period of time, 
et cetera. And so you can get this burden. And so at the moment, things continue as they are. We don't see a lot of pressure on those beds, but in January, uh, we were certainly seeing a lot more points where in the very near future um, they were. And in parts of the Commonwealth, they were actually being uh, quite overwhelmed and having to redirect and keep people at home and send people out of state. And so then we do a more detailed breakdown so that people in the different health districts uh, can sort of look at what the projections currently say under these different conditions where there's things stay as they are, the Delta starts to predominate. Uh, we have this sort of worst case scenario of transmission rates, et cetera. And so we summarize all of those. Um, we give a, a view on what the population immunity is. Um, and then we have some additional analyses. And I just wanna pause here uh, briefly before I um, wrap up and that we've got um, Scenario Modeling Hub, which is this consortium of different academic teams um, that we're working with. And this sort of provides in an, another way of providing our model results, but it sort of gets ensembled with uh, multiple other university uh, and institute uh, teams. Uh, and that's been feeding into the CDC um, a pipeline uh, of um, informing uh, the COVID response. We've also been engaged here in the Virginia um, genomic surveillance and then also have these mobility, uh, data-driven mobile vaccine clinic site selection effort with VDH. And so I'll go into a little bit of detail. So Modeling Hub, we have this nice MMWR um, publication back in May. Um, and when this got published, um, the director of the CDC was sort of using it to sort of highlight the importance of sort of getting more vaccine out uh, over the course of the summer and what the benefits of those were. We've been doing these in multiple rounds. And so round five became available. Now round six is just concluded. And those reports are going out and have been briefed elsewhere. And we're pl planning round seven now. Um, and so you can see round six, we're covering a variant kind of condition and then also sort of better or worse vaccination. And so to use this, um, these are what the Virginia plots look like. Our engagement with um, the sequencing effort. And so this is a question about how do we guide and make our surveillance in the future more efficient? And so we're doing these power calculations uh, to help guide how many sequences we, we would need to achieve to be able to detect uh, variants as they emerge either in different counties or different regions of the Commonwealth. And this is um, a little bit complicated of a calculation that the, 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 the people who are in charge of doing the sequencing don't quite have the biostatistical knowledge to do. And we've been engaged with them for quite a bit to sort of plan out and sort of give these, what if uh, you missed it for the first couple of weeks and it grew, um, what kind of, what size would the outbreak be, et cetera. And then these vaccination clinic sites. And I think this is the really key um, engagement we're currently involved in and sort of excited about is that we're using SafeCraft data. So like real time cell phone aggregated uh, mobility data to help guide the um, placement of these mobile vaccine clinics. And so as we get to where acceptance and the proportion vaccinated are getting tighter and tighter, there's still people out there that are willing to get vaccinated. They just aren't willing to go through the trouble of logging into a website or finding uh, one of the sites. Many of the sites have started to shut down because they just don't have enough customers. And so they've moved to these vans that can be deployed to a parking lot of um, a, a store, for instance, or set up shop, uh, you know, next to a um, fire department or something like that. And, and then give people that are just driving down the street, like, hey, stop in and get a vaccine, uh, yeah. you know, while you're waiting um, for your laundry yeah. to finish up or something. And so taking the data, uh, the, the, the census block group, we're seeing where they visit. And then we're able to even give targeted uh, advice about like, if you're trying to get young African-Americans or black Virginians, um, if you're trying to get vaccines into their arms in this particular district, here's the kinds of sites uh, that they might be visiting a bit more. And obviously different racial or age groups are going to aggregate in different um, shopping type centers or other places uh, throughout the week. And so we're trying to give those guidances so they can be a little bit more pinpoint and show up in the afternoon where um, there might be a lot more of the people they're trying to get vaccines to that they know are under vaccinated. And so we're really excited about that. Um, in closing, basically there's been a lot of challenges during um, the support process here. We've uh, had you know, pushback politically, uh, challenges about whether the model itself was um, 
strong enough to really recommend some of these closures. There have been um, calls to, to our homes or my, uh, to, I've gotten some calls from people that have voiced their um, disagreement with some of our model analysis or some of the, what they perceive to be the policy decisions taken because of some of the things that we've put out there. Uh, but that sort of comes with the territory and is also very useful feedback to sort of understand um, what is guiding some of the decisions that uh, people are making and what the, uh, the political ramifications of all these kinds of decisions really do matter. Um, and as a public health person, you always want to optimize health, but there's counterbalancing um, costs to sort of having purely optimal health. Um, and with that, I'm glad to wrap up here and pass the mic. Okay, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kimmy. So we have a handful of questions from the audience. Um, I'll read I'm gonna, the, policy, the, the procedure is I'll read through these and either Brian or Kimmy can answer. Uh, some of them are directed and I'll indicate that if they're directed at one of the speakers. I'll start. Um, I have two questions and either can answer. The first one's uh, more for Kimmy though. It's, it's really about, I, th I think your, your presentation made a case that othering and trust is important and ex has existed for a long time. Um, maybe it's a human basic capacity of some sort. Um, and there wasn't the, the emphasis of your talk wasn't on fixing it. How can we fix it if we can fix it? Um, what's the low hanging fruit and what's the role of technology potentially for, for better or worse in a sense. So for example, Twitter and maybe um, advanced economic, uh, epi epidemiological surveillance or maybe something like machine learning. I don't know. And then the second question is, is, directed at both really, but it's, um, it's, it's coming from Brian's talk, the vulnerability index that you show is very interesting. So you see a, some relation anyway, between vulnerability and, and vaccination, right? So it's a nice concrete um, correlation we're looking at. And um, so this index, does it, does it map in any way to um, racial and ethnic divisions in the country in a sense, or is it capturing something else? It's a specific state. It's, we, I don't know if you know, Brian, what this represents, but the, whatever it represents, does it, does it ask us to, um, to, to, to maybe refine what we mean by otherness? Is this an otherness measure? And is it just on the racial ethnic dimension? And the reason I ask that is because, you know, in the current context, in the United States anyway, we have, there is an emphasis on racial inequality, but there's other kinds of inequalities and therefore there may be other kinds of otherness and do we have to think about that? Those are my two questions. And then I'll, um, after that, I'll go through the, the list. Great, Whoever wants to start. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, thanks for thanks for the question and and thanks, Brian, for the really exciting talk. Uh, the I, I loved um, I loved all the graphs and maps. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm a social scientist who looks at problems and doesn't always uh, look at solutions. So your question is really hard, Mark, um, especially because what we know about you know trust is really hard to earn, um, and it takes a long time. And I think that you know. Um, it's, it's especially hard during a pandemic to build trust. And I was just thinking, you know, as I was listening to, to, um, to Brian kind of at the closing, you know, talking about, you know, how, um, you know, even if something is, um, is modeled and data driven and, and oriented towards, you know, keeping people healthy, you know, I mean, um, I don't know that Brian personally benefits from other people staying healthy, you know, so much as like, this is something that, um, that, you know, one can be emotionally disinvested in and, and just rely on the data and say, look, like the data is saying we need to close this down, you know, and it's not forever, but just until things cool off. Um, but if there is this lack of trust, or if there are other agents who are out there, you know, trying to so um, you know, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Discord. Discord, or just like, um, you know, let's play devil's advocate. You know, like there's always that person, mm -hmm. you know, like on Twitter, right? The reply guy who's like, well, what about, you know, and, and, um, and I think that there are people, you know, unfortunately, I think the current situation with social media is that there is a, there is a reification of people who play these roles. And, and, and so that's really hard, you know, combating that, I think, 
um, because it seems as if we are being open to debate and, but, but it's not in good faith. And so, you know, I was thinking about, you know, just kind of like listening to Brian's talk, I was like, well, what could you do that would, um, that would build trust, right? That would involve people, you know, and, and from, you know, the studies in political science and social science more generally, like thinking about how do you build trust? It's usually through citizen engagement, mm -hmm. right? So in my own work, you know, I, 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 I use a lot of survey data from Afrobarometer, um, which is you know, a pan-African research network that collects surveys across um, African countries, it's been doing it since 1999. Um, but when I, when I present results from that survey in various African settings, people are like, who did you even talk to? You know, what do you, and, and, and there is this you know, concern or you know, interest in, in knowing more. And, and if someone's not familiar with it, then how are they going to trust it? And, and so it's not just as an engagement, but transparency. Um, and so, you know, my own thinking, you know, about, about Brian's, um, Brian and, and his team's work is, is like, you know, are there hackathons you could do with the public that would give them, you know, like the data are out there and freely available. Like we, we don't have some sort of monopoly on evidence and truth, you know, it's, it's often, you know, public source data that all of us can, and I think that, you know, a longer term investment in getting, getting regular folks um, to believe science. I mean, that's a bit, that's a bigger, you know, I, I think that as, as scientists, like we need to regularly engage the public, which is why I'm sure, you know, NSF Prepare is having this, you know, live streamed on YouTube is because mm -hmm. It's not, it's not just for academics to talk to each other about the things that they're finding, but really for it to reach a broader public and for them to understand, you know, the motivations here are not because, you know, I, I want to point out racists, you know, I take no pleasure in that, right? What I, what I want to do is to make sure people stay healthy. And one of the ways that people aren't staying healthy is by otherizing diseases and thinking that they themselves are invincible. And I, and, and so, you know, that's why I do this research, you know, and, and, um, and I think that's why a lot of us who, who study public health and epidemics, you know, we, we do it because we want people to not get sick and die. And so, uh, but I, I don't know, given the, particularly in the United States, but also in other places, when health is politicized, it's going to be very hard to convince others that what you're doing is coming from a place that is, um, you know, dispassionate, but really evidence-based. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Brian, do you want to? Yeah, no, I think that's really key. And I think that is one of the things that I think has really been important throughout this pandemic. And I think a challenge for folks like ourselves who are trying to synthesize all this data in real time and try and give like some indication about what might be happening in the future uh, etc. Some of the emails I get though is like, well, you know, two months ago, you said that it might get really bad around now and it's not so bad right now. So why were you wrong? Like, why were you wrong? Uh, and that you run the risk then of sort of decreasing uh, the trust. And so the communication about what that curve really looks like, and it's, it's very challenging because some people are just going to see that one curve and say, oh, big spike in May. And then they wait till May and they'd be like, there's no spike in May. Uh, you were wrong, you're stupid, your models are silly or something. Um, and that like being able to succinctly say that was under a worst case if like X, Y, and Z happened. Uh, and that's why we try and avoid the, the pure forecast and make it more of a projection, but that is a nuance that I think most people sort of don't pay too much attention to. Uh, and so I think it's really important in the communication aspect. And that's where I think scientists, like we need to engage more with the press. And I think the press also has some work to do to become a little bit more scientifically literate or ability to communicate the this, this sort of science uh, a little bit better. I mean, we saw a similar kind of thing with the climate debate as well. <laughs> and I think, um, I think we're now starting to see some of the, the results of that disbelief or whatever. And I guess to mark your other point about the, um, social vulnerability and the sort of measurement of that as otherness. I think some of the factors that go into the social vulnerability index, a lot of it is unfortunately sort of income driven or resource driven, mm -hmm. which unfortunately race in our country is pretty reasonably correlated with 
the sort of amount of resource that one has. Uh, and so I think that does correlate um, to quite a bit of degree in terms of uh, folks that might be places that have more of the other folks uh, might be a little bit less resourced. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it explicitly uh, tries to do that. It just happens to rely on a lot of measures that are correlated. Yeah, Kimmy, do you want to comment on that? I mean, one question I had was, does it make us redefine it? I mean, I believe the correlation for sure. I mean, that's part of the structural racism that we have as part of our country. But at the same time, there's a lot of poor others that aren't necessarily from, for example, from an African-American um, uh, origin, right? So what do we do with that? How do we, do we have to redefine otherness? I mean, maybe that's a, another hard question that we don't can't answer now, but I wonder about that because I think other people wonder too. No, I think that, um, so when I think about pandemic othering, it's, it's, um, it's not, um, it's usually based on identity and not, mm -hmm. uh, not class, not class identity. Um, and, and that's because, um, I mean, maybe in the U S we might consider mm -hmm. class because, um, there's something stigmatized about being poor, right? No one ever wants to say they're right. poor. Right. And so, um, so, so I, I would say like groups that carry stigma are the mm -hmm. ones um, that, that we should be concerned because if, if something is a disease of the poor, right? So this is why I was really concerned about the early reporting on COVID-19. It's like, oh, well, essential workers are, are mm -hmm. the ones who are most likely to get infected. And it's like, of course, because they're the ones who are going to work, mm -hmm. right? And, and they don't have the option to work from home. And um, and their ability to ride through this crisis is dependent on their on their access to work to meet their basic needs. Um, but if you if if the media frame it in a certain way, right, it looks like well, it's only poor people who are going to get it, right? So so and and if poor being poor, right, poverty is stigmatized in America. Then um, then you as a person who works from home, you know, you might not be concerned because you're you know. And so you may engage in behaviors that um, that actually put you at greater risk. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, it's not just people who are essential workers who are, you know, economically required to go to work. Um, so I, I think, it, you know, but I don't know that that is. Um, I don't know the extent to which we can disentangle that from race. Mm -hmm. Right, sure. because of the way at least the United States is structured, but, but the United States is not alone in that marginalized groups also tend to be economically marginalized. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if you want to get down like into the data, you could right, only look at people who are from a certain economic class and you can still see patterns in infection mm -hmm. rates, right? Um, and yep. not all of that is going to be network due to network effects. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I think the stigmatization is uh, really hits the nail on the head in a certain way. So let me move on to some other questions. Um, and thank you for all the people who's posted. So just to start, one of the, one of the uh, commenters actually just wanted to, to say that they were grateful. They made a comment. They're grateful that we're addressing otherness. So thank you, Kimmy. Um, first question. Um, I'm just going to read them mainly as they're written, and uh, I might paraphrase a little bit, but given that othering can be used as a tool for consolidating political coalitions uh, towards certain health solutions, what are ways that the health programs can either exacerbate or mitigate against othering? So I guess this could go at different levels of scale, because you can think of health programs as, as whatever they are on the ground or you know, at a national level or an international level. So whoever, I think that was, this is directed to Kimmy, but Brian, feel free to chime in. So I, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, there, there are a lot of approaches to, um, to this problem. And, and I think perhaps most importantly, and we've seen this um, based on a lot of public health studies, that there's a need for long-term investment of training of frontline healthcare workers in providing culturally competent care, right? And in, in, in recognizing, uh, um, uh, racial and ethnic health disparities um, and, 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 and treating according, you know, according to the needs of the, um, the, the patient in front of you. Um, but I also think in the, the I mean, that's a long-term investment. It's going to take a lot of time to, you know, retrain uh, frontline healthcare workers. But I also think that in the short term during a pandemic, um, 
there's there's need to engage appropriate um, and trustworthy messengers in um, in public health campaigns that are targeting marginalized groups. So if we know that there are you know in 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 societies that have these marginalized groups, you can't just use a, the standard kind of general public health campaign because if if that group is marginalized, they are unlikely to trust the um, the messenger from this kind of like general government who has you know, oppressed and marginalized them in the past. And so you're going to need to engage um, leaders from those communities who are trusted by those communities. So, um, you know, um, again, like Kathy Cohen's Boundaries of Blackness suggested that during the AIDS pandemic, this would have been, for example, um, pastors in black churches, right? And, you know, unfortunately during that pandemic, you know, they, they actually were, um, uh, made it much more difficult in the black community to, to respond to AIDS. But, but um, there are such, you know, leaders within communities that could be um, really strong uh, messengers for, for public health campaigns. Um, likewise, I think it's important to frame uh, pandemics as, as generalized pandemics and not as something that is um, specifically targeted to communities. Um, my colleague at UC Riverside, Jennifer Marola, who studies political psychology, has um, a new study with, um, with colleagues at UC San Diego that looks at you know, what, what gets people, what, what emotions can you elicit that get people to actually um, it, report at least to have um, to engage in preventive behaviors. And uh, there's a lot of there there are a lot of studies in psychology and in political psychology to look at, you know, what what emotions can we elicit in ordinary people? Disgust mm -hmm. is the one that's usually associated with othering. And that's the emotion you don't want to elicit. Um, but Brian, you may be um, uh, thrilled to know that forecasts that um, that raise people's anxiety levels and sadness actually get them to engage in preventive behavior. So there are some things we can do, right? And, and forecasts, you know, it's not just for nerds, right? It's for ordinary people too, you know, forecasts, you know, so Jen Marola and, and, and colleagues have found that when shown a forecast, it does raise people's level of anxiety and sadness. And I don't wanna make people more anxious and sad. The pandemic has done enough of that for all of us, but seeing those forecasts and having that elevated anxiety and sadness actually led people to be more likely to say that they would adopt pr protective and preventive behaviors. And so I do think that, um, you know, when you use a forecast, you're not talking about a specific group, you're talking about everyone, right? And so you're talking about a pandemic generally and not to a specific mm. group. And I think that that's something we can do early on in pandemics. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's a nice link to forecasting. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to skip around a little bit in the questions just for fun. So, so this one's for Brian, but maybe also Kimmy, it says from the commenter. Um, do government agencies take uh, institutional trust into account in their decisions? And I'll just add to that otherness too, right? And Brian, like maybe, for example, have you, you know, you're in meetings with DOD and with VDH. Does this ever come up? I mean, what, how do they frame it? What do they want to know about it, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think definitely. I mean, I think they're well aware of the, the trust boundary. And I think uh, we're at the stage now with the vaccination campaign, for instance, where um, sort of the, the low hanging fruit have all been gathered. And it really is the hard to reach, the more, the less trusting uh, individuals in the population that are like, well, I'm open to it, but I'm not so sure I'm eager for it. Um, and it's those people. And I think at least public health, you know, they, they're, they're clued in on a lot of these um, issues. And we really are at that sort of hard work where it really does need to be, as Kimmy was saying, sort of at the grassroots. And you do need to find these trusted partners in these particular populations that are under vaccinated uh, to build that trust. And then you need to lower the barrier. And that's part of the thing. I think Virginia is doing a reasonable job in many other states as well of making it so we'll drive the vaccine to you, okay? So we don't have to worry about organizing a bunch of people into a carpool and all showing up at uh, some centralized location somewhere. Like, we'll, we'll bring it to you, uh, but it really is making sure that the, the, the customers are there. And so I think the decisions that VDH is making, I think DOD as well, uh, federal level, maybe a little bit lesser degree because they just aren't quite as in the weeds in a lot of these decisions. Um, but 
for the operational public health folks, they are taking that into account. They know that they take certain actions, it might not result in what they would hope just because of that, that, that trust barrier. And I, I think certainly the Secretary of Health here in Virginia is aware of that. It's just, you're, you're sort of dealt the hand you have. It's like you said, Jimmy, you can't magically buy a bunch of trust very easily in the midst of a crisis. So you can try and maintain a consistent behavior that is trust building uh, so you don't further degrade it, um, but it is hard to sort of build up. Um, you're sort of set where you are. Okay. Um, Kimmy, if, if you don't have a comment on that, that's fine too. I have another question just directed at you. Um, but I, Brian, again, please feel free to chime in. This is one of my favorite ones. What should be the constraints for social media companies in mitigating reduction in institutional trust? And I'd just add, why not reduction in otherness and why not building trust? And I'll add one more thing. Just, you know, otherness is like built into social media. That's how, that's why it goes in, in, in some ways. That's one of the, and you know, that's one of the issues with social media is just the fact that people do this by nature and it really blows up in many different crazy ways. But anyway, I'll let you comment. This is tough because, you know, social media companies are private organizations, mm. right? There's, um, you know, they, um, they get to decide for themselves, you know, they police themselves mostly. Um, and, and, and we've seen that a lot, I think, um, in, in the last, um, in the last few years. Um, I do think though, that, um, at least, you know, I have friends who are PhDs in political science who went to go work for some of the, some of the largest, um, social media companies and are, are, and are specifically looking at trying to understand this, right? So working on the civic integrity team at Twitter and, um, and, 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 and the equivalent at Facebook. Um, and I think that, you know, um, what I like about their approach is that they're trying to think of it, not just from the U S perspective, but looking at comparative examples, you know, elsewhere, for example, you, some of you may not know that Twitter was banned in Nigeria. And that was because, um, you know, the, the Nigerian president had, you know, um, tweeted something that, that seemed like a threat to a particular group of people um, in, in Southeastern Nigeria. And, you know, that evoked this, you know, civil war that happened decades ago, um, in which, you know, millions of people were displaced and, you know, thousands died. Um, and, and Twitter removed the, the president's post and, you know, the Nigerian government fought back with, well, we're just going to be on Twitter and no one's allowed to use it. And what's interesting is in that case, right, we see that, you know, um, the, the government tried, you know, the Nigerian government tried to get involved um, in something that they thought was, um, was going to, you know, lead people to have a negative impression of their government, right? Um, and it backfired. You know, there's since been, you know, like a last court ruling that is, you know, allowed, you know, has said you, you can't, you, know, you can't jail people for using Twitter. It's, you know, um, but, you know, through most of this, you know, there, there really wasn't much action by the social media company, right? Twitter didn't really do anything. It just kind of let people keep tweeting and, um, you know, even from Nigeria. And so I think that, you know, I don't know that they are built or equipped to engage in the kind of um, uh, engage in the needed work to ensure that the information that's in the public is something that you know that produces trust. I think that they're they're actually built to to um, democratize the you know you know, not, not in a good way, right? But like everyone gets a voice now, you know, it's like, well, you know, journalism had norms about, you know, whose voice was heard. And so as we see the rise of social media, we're actually seeing changes in journalism mm -hmm. about, you know, sources and, you know, who gets, you know, and, and this like need for fairness leads to people who have a platform that probably shouldn't, right? They're not necessarily equipped or qualified, but, um, they're popular, but that doesn't mean that, you know, they have information. And I think that this is something, um, this is a very long way of me saying, I don't think we have a good answer for this. And I don't think social media companies are equipped to deal with it. And unfortunately, what is happening in social media is actually eroding existing norms 
that we're leading to, that, that we're generating more trust, right? And um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of good research on political communication that shows, you know, if you compare, for example, the U.S. to Sweden, this, you know, the Swedes have a lot more trust, um, are more politically engaged, and part of that is because there's a public, um, you know, there there's there's public journalism. You know, there's there, their NPR is what everyone listens to in Sweden, whereas here in the United States we have this, you know, open free media system that anyone can engage in. Well, when you do that, um, it, it doesn't lead to the best outcomes for informing the public. Okay. Brian, do you, do you want to comment? No, no need to or pressure, but if you... So I think, uh, the only thing I would say is that it's been amazing during this outbreak that Twitter has also been very useful as a scientific tool. Like there's been a lot of communication mm -hmm. about data and things, but, you know, I follow certain people. If I followed other people, I'm sure I'd be hearing the the opposite of those uh, scientific facts and details, uh, et cetera. And I've built out my trust in different ways than other people might, but I think it is a, yeah, it, it's a difficult beast. It's useful, but also it has been very harmful as well. Okay, well, I think, um... I think we have time maybe for one more question. I just got a new question. And I mean, this is just to extend the trust piece. I mean, so thinking of trust as something we've been talking about it really kind of from a, a perspective of governance and trust. There's a populace and there, there's also groups. People use trust, um, you know, in cooperation. How do you cooperate within, within communities? Does that affect this? There's also, you know, choosing what group to associate with you start to trust them, you can, that can generate identities. And those are more nuanced networked kind of things, but this is, you know, that kind of talk. And I mean, this is this kind of context for prepare. Um, and it's really about how communities are forming and changing and who's joining what and how, what are the dynamics of those? And maybe social media, but maybe not, maybe on the ground, maybe in physical, real networks, communication networks, or people knowing each other communities. Is there a, a different kind of trust dynamic that operates there and how do we measure it? And how would it affect people's behavior with respect to, you know, compliance of vaccination? Is there any data on that? I don't. I don't know. It's just a question from one of the audience members. One data point I can point to, at least when we're looking at this vaccine acceptance, like one of the key things that people cite is that they, why would what would convince you to get the vaccine if you're sort of hesitant? And it's mainly recommendation from a doctor or a friend, and those are sort of that trust mm -hmm. is strong and compelling sort of thing that maybe the institutions, I don't trust them. I don't, if right. public health tells me to do it. If Tony Fauci tells me to do it, I'm not going to listen to it. But if my, my mom or, you know, my coworker who I hang out with a lot did it and thinks it's a good idea, then maybe I would do it. Uh, and I think that's the phase we're also moving into is where mm -hmm. more and more primary care workers, you know, those that are, <laughs> those that are still standing, um, we'll start doing the outreach and be able to sort of say, you're in the office for your checkup on your heart. Let me give you the vaccine now. And I think mm -hmm. it's a really good idea. Um, and that trust that uh, happens between a patient and a doctor, I think could be utilized to sort of help get us up to higher numbers. Yeah. I think it is different depending on who it is and the um, activity that someone's gonna engage in. So uh, I'll just add um, that, you know, in the, in the analysis that I shared earlier, I just looked at like, I, I just showed you the, the section of the graph that looked at state capacity, but there's, there's another section later in the graph that looked at interpersonal trust. So when we talk about institutional trust, we're talking about, you know, trust in government, um, trust in authority. Interpersonal trust is, you know, trust in your community. Like how much do you, would you trust, you know, another person in your society? And, and these are all coming from the same um, survey measures, right? So uh, the, the data in that paper used um, data from the World Value Survey, which you know, has cross-national data, but also supplemented with um, LAPOP, or also known as Latino Barometer um, for, for countries in Latin America. And, um, and you know, the findings on interpersonal trust are not as robust as the findings on institutional trust. But as the pandemic has gone on, that correlation has become more statistic, it has, has shown statistical significance um, as we get further in the pandemic and we have um, more data on COVID-19 more, COVID mortality. Um, so, you know, the correlation is there. I don't, I don't know that how much we should read into that, but I do think that 
um, when we talk about trust, it's not, we shouldn't just be talking about trust and governance. I think this is a good question um, that's been raised by the audience. We should be thinking about, you know, um, both vertical trust and horizontal trust mm-hmm. um, and, and building, building both of those uh, simultaneously in order to get people to, you know, to do the things that they need to do to keep themselves and their communities healthy. Okay. Well, with that, I think we are now um, gonna, at the end of the session. Thank you, Brian and Kimmy, and thank you for and the audience um, for all the, the interesting questions. I just want to remind people we start again at 2 p.m. Same Zoom channel, right, Aaron? Please get if I'm wrong. Yes. Yes, it's all okay. the same. Same YouTube channel. Yep. And so, I'm sorry, same YouTube channel. So. Um, with that, I think we can close out. Is there any other comments from Anil? Do we need to make, or do we see everything um, too? Yeah, I just like to add. So first of all, thanks uh, for the excellent talks and the great discussion. Um, I think it is uh, the uh, uh, speakers can answer some of the questions on the YouTube chat as well, right, Erin? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, Kimmy, if you, uh, yeah. So I don't know how to uh, like. Uh, how would you suggest that? And uh, they should the just questions. The questions will be transferred to the YouTube chat. And and it, Kimmy, if you can continue to engage with folks, that would be great. Yeah, if I could just add uh, Anil and Erin and Mark. First of all, thanks a lot to Kimmy and, and Brian stepping in. This just a, turned out to be actually a very very good uh, set of talks. But uh, importantly, please engage um, the audience on the YouTube channel. This is an asynchronous workshop. So we are hoping that beyond the discussion now, we'll continue to have this debate and discussion. I think uh, Kimmy's talk really uh, highlighted the need for a discussion and debate because that's the only way we'll build uh, a robust trust in, in the system. So I think you folks uh, should continue to do that. Thank you.